round two. Round one was the horrible reality of many an agency and how they can steal from streamers and YouTubers with bad deals. And in this video, we broke down literally everything that I can think of as to what to avoid when you are dealing with an agency as you will invariably have to do at a certain level of content creation. But even if you are going to be running a business or you're going to be part of a business, this advice is pertinent because many, 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 many people will run into a situation where they're dealing with this. So the first video was profoundly negative intent because we were focusing on that. This video today, this video today is going to be equally as important in a different direction. And this is a video answering some of the questions that I have gotten asked thousands of times, literally thousands of times, which is all about, okay, Devin, you've explained to us how you are going to avoid, or we are going to avoid like bad agencies and uh, all the kind of like pitfalls that streamers and content creators have to deal with, um, in, in like dealing with these agencies. How do we find a good one? What is a good agency? What goes into finding one? What's the difference between an esports team and agency and org? Even just knowing that alone will be like a huge benefit to you because like you'll be able to know so much more about how these businesses operate as you watch the stuff you watch or you understand the industry. It's just good to have this understanding of the industry because like you can be that guy that's like reading the Kotaku article and you're like, oh yeah, I know how this really works, right? You'd be that person. That person's cool. So you want to do that. Um, also, one of the most common questions I get asked will be answered today, which is what size should you be when you're looking for an agency? What can you expect? How much money? All of that and more will be answered today via Devin Nash. Let's begin. First of all, all right. So let's talk about the difference between an esports team, an agency, and an org. I think this is a really good way to actually kick this off, to kick this pig. Uh, an agency is a organization company uh, that represents you, typically as what's called an AOR, uh, or agent of record, in business dealings, media, uh, media dealings, partnerships, etc., and the typical agency model is to, uh, so ex is to, we'll just put it over here, take 20% of the earnings, um, sorry, 20% of the deals that they bring in slash they negotiate on behalf of the talent or company, entity, et cetera. Cool. So an agency... Uh, so what I do, I run an agency with my business partner, Matt. We run an agency. It's uh, Nerd Fusion, also called Novo Studios, is an agency that we take 20% of the deals that we bring talent or that we negotiate on their behalf. Okay? Very simple. But we could see in the previous video how there are all sorts of ways to mess this up and to uh, make it not seem like that or take more or things like that. But ideally, an agency operates like this. Okay? An esports team is pretty separate. So an esports team, this is something that's like, like this right here will be like the first bomb drop. Agency, like, like esports teams are basically agencies. They're basically agencies. Basically agencies. But instead of repping talent, they represent, still as an AOR, their players. But the model, and it's the same thing, in business dealings, media dealings, partnerships, etc. But the model typically is to pay a salary to the player instead of taking a percentage of deals. Instead, what an esports team does is they work directly with brands to, to actually sponsor the team itself. And the idea is that a portion of that is passed on to players. So esports teams are actually in a lot of ways working in a little bit of a more nefarious way because they're probably taking way more than 20%. The value of an esports team is only insofar as its brand and the players that represent its brand. If you go to an esports player's stream, okay, 
you will see that they represent a bunch of brands. But in fact, unless it's a very rare case, they actually don't get paid to represent those brands. That is actually made up in the salary of that player. Now, granted, some players make some pretty massive salaries, particularly in CSGO. There are some teams in Europe that can make up to $20,000 a month per player, $30,000 a month per player. But still, as a proportion of the Series A, the investment, and the, um, and the amount of money that that team is, is, is bringing in, it's actually a pretty infinitesimal amount. So esports teams are kind of better set up to take more money out of, the, uh, out of uh, players and not give it back. Now, we're sort of seeing a world that's sort of transitioning where uh, there are individual sponsorships for players. So players are starting to get into the mode of having individual sponsorships and those being independently negotiated by the esports teams. But still, the vast majority of, 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 of sponsorships work on a team level right now. That's the, and that's a big difference. Otherwise, for all extents and purposes, agencies are esports teams and vice versa. The contracts look very similar. I've negotiated hundreds of them uh, across both. Uh, like They look pretty much the same. The rights are similar. If anything, esports teams typically require more rights out of um out of a out of a creator than they do um otherwise so require more rights typically uh you'll generally see this in terms of like exclusivity um or uh likeness right or clauses and things like that so we talked about those in an earlier video where they will require more from agencies. Agencies will typically just be like, hey, we're your exclusive AOR. We don't really care what you do. Your content is your own. But esports teams may try to own your content. We've seen several different kind of bad-ish deals where esports teams have actually taken ownership of the content that their players are creating and then monetize based on it. And um, we might see things in the future when esports starts to get more prominent where we, the esports teams actually sell those rights back to the players, as we've seen in things like music, for example, where that happens. That's not good. Uh, and then last one is an organization. Uh, this can be like your stream teams or um, like group of people uh, or like a guild, right? Like uh, previously what Method is presently or um, like what uh, Zizarin's team is, like uh, Exiles, right? Uh, these are generally just um, some combination of everything. And they just, it just, it's the catch all category for anything that's not an official agency and not an esports team. Um, also, another important note if you are an agency, in some states you need to register as such, uh, which is a different, a different designation than an esports team, for example. That can happen. Not really important for the purpose of uh, what we're doing. Cool. So, what uh, types of agencies are there? So, Types of agencies. So now we're going into that kind of world. The first agency that I would describe is the most common and most powerful, uh, which is I would call Hollywood agencies. So this is your CAA, which is Creative Artists Association, and uh, IMG, which is uh, IMG slash WME, and uh, UTA. Okay, and they do represent Twitch streamers and YouTubers, but kind of to a smaller extent than they represent um, celebrity talent. These are your, are your big guns. These guys can do movie deals. They can do publishing stuff. Um, they can do, um, what else? They can do book deals. They can do all kinds of stuff like that. And that uh, sounds really cool. But typically, the big problem you're going to run into with agencies like Hollywood agencies, especially if you are a smaller creator, is they are just not going to give as much attention to you as they would a you know, a, 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 a The Rock or someone like that, right? Because these are the types of agencies that represent those people. But their deals are typically the same. Um, it's also important to note that the way that these guys do deals is they usually do deals that are high value and rare. So you might get, I don't know, one to th like two to four deals a year from a company like this. But those deals are exceptionally high value and they're typically i mean in the in the tens and hundreds of thousands sometimes millions of dollars so these guys focus on getting very few extremely high quality deals and that's how hollywood agencies work they have the most connections in the space but the most common complaint from content creators that join these agencies is I don't feel like I'm being paid attention to. There's just some nameless agent that manages my account that doesn't really care because these are guys that have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And again, um, I, I'm calling out these agencies, uh, CAA and WMA and UTA, not saying these agencies do this, right? You're gonna have to do your own research. I obviously can't tell you 
either I have my opinions, but I can't tell you other either way. I'm just giving you the general perception of how these agencies work because I can't individually call other agencies as I am an agent myself, which would be this kind of like crazy bias time vortex loop that ends all of humanity if I like break the time stream in that way and I tell you all of that. So I can't do that, right? So that's your uh, that's your first agency type is the Hollywood agencies. I think we covered that pretty well. Okay. The next type of agency is the opposite of that is I would call a deal flow agency. Um, a deal flow agency is an example of that is like Adder, um, also Stream Elements and Stream Labs operate as agencies in this sense, although they don't exclusively rep people, Adder does. Uh, these are agencies that bring you a ton of deals and it's up to you uh, to sort of, to sort or figure out um, which ones you want and which you don't. So Adder, for example, which is an agency that works with us, and uh, we've done a lot of business with them, and their CEO is great. Uh, company in general is very good. I have positive things to think about Adder, and I, I generally I, I generally don't feel bad if somebody selects Adder over us as an agency to go with for a lot of reasons, which is not something I would say for a, a lot of agencies. Adder brings you a lot of deals, and it's up to you to sort of for, sort through them. So they'll bring you the mobile game offers, but they'll also bring you like maybe high quality deals that they find, or, or you know things they get through outbound or inbound or things like that. Um, it's worth think uh, it's worth thinking about that um, a large part of what all agencies do is actually process your inbound. So when you're a content creator or a celebrity of some level you will not want to process all of your inbound emails and all of the stuff you're getting because you don't have time or you just CBA. That is a, a lot of the business that deal flow agencies get is by going through your email, going through your Instagram DMs and just taking out those deals, talking to those people and saying, hey, um, what's, uh, what do you want to do here? Or maybe they upsell it or whatever. And then they also have some, full, some amount of outbound. outbound. It kind of depends on um, what... Uh, um, what the nature of the agency is. The most typical complaints with these agencies is that they have too low value of deals or there are deals that are kind of like lower quality, which is um, like uh, mobile games or like Raid Shadow Legends type stuff. Um, a lot of times you'll, if you're getting an email, so anybody that's ever like been a creator, You'll get like for me, even me. It's kind of funny that I get these because they obviously don't do their research and like. But they send me these emails. They're like, "Hi, I'm from Banana Nana Agency, blah blah, and I've got an incredible deal for you. We'll pay you five hundred dollars an hour to play Raid Challenges." I'm like, "Oh, okay, here we go. This is a." And I always send them an email back, and I'm like, "Yeah, so uh, do you know who you're talking to?" Because obviously they don't. What they're doing is they're taking a list of the top ten thousand Twitch streamers. They're just blasting it out, okay? And so these are almost always bad agencies to go with. These are what I would call deal flow agencies. That the the, the the type of stuff is typically pretty low value and it's typically um, like mobile games and stuff like that. However, there are certain deal flow agencies that have actually circumvented this by offering high quality deals because deals they're conscious of this weakness. Adder is such an agency. They're, they're, they're people that have like figured out how to circumvent that weakness, for example. Um, and, and typically people that um, go with them and some of the other agencies in the deal flow space are, um, are, are report positive results. So that is typically the complaint of deal flow agencies is um, we just get too low value deals, just too many like mobile games, too much BS. Like I'm not getting a lot of high quality deals. I'm not getting a lot of deals that um, uh, uh, reach out to me. Okay. Third type of agency is called a boutique agency. Uh, this is Nerd Fusion uh, slash Nova Studios uh, and also Loaded. I'll use those two examples. Because I think we're the only two in the space that really do this. A boutique agency is an agency that specifies to you, uh, learns what you're about, sells to your uh, parameters, and um, usually represents you directly. Um, and like you're like a person. Typically, you will be able to talk to like the highest levels of people in the company. Um, you will be have regular meetings with their sales team. Um, for example, certain there, there's one particular person that we represent that really values um, animals, and uh, we represent her uh, in, uh, in in specific deals to that end. I don't want to be too specific um, because one part of boutique agencies is they don't typically announce all of the talent that they have. Uh, we have some public facing talent. Most of the talent we have today, we don't tell people who we represent. Uh, boutique agencies are very specific. 
they um, they take care of people very specifically. And for that reason, they um, have very few clients. So these are typically your smallest agencies and they're um, they're kind of a good to great principle or sort of like a small giants principle where they operate in a boutique fashion because they want to serve people in a specific way. Common complaints of boutique agencies is um, that they don't do enough because they are typically very owner driven. So Matt and I kind of like lead everything at Nerd Fusion, for example, um, and we are uh, we are very busy, so th that can give people the feeling that like we're not doing enough. That's very common um, uh, uh, of of agencies like ours. And then, of course, the other problem with other agencies like ours is that we're way too exclusive. So it's it's unlikely that you'll be able to join an agency like this. Loaded to some extent has circumvented this problem by um, by operating in um, with just a larger staff, uh, and, and they've kind of like moved from like a boutique agency almost to like a deal flow agency with the amount of people they represent. They certainly started off in this way. Um, another really, uh, this reminds me, another really common, um, co criticism of boutique agencies is that they only pay attention to their top talent. So if, if you are a, uh, but this is sort of a criticism of all agencies. You're going to see this kind of everywhere. I I'd say it's especially prominent in boutique agencies where it's like, okay, I've got three of like the top creators who have like 10,000 concurrence and they're getting all of the deals. And then the people that are below that don't get any deals. And this is because they don't, um, depending on how large your company is, your sales assets may not benefit the smaller broadcasters on your roster. Um, so, so sometimes they can get a feeling of being left out. Boutique agencies are very good choices for people that really want like that special touch that maybe you have like an incredible unique brand. Like you're not just doing something where you just like stream video games on Twitch. You're doing like a huge variety of stuff. And the clients that we typically serve are um, people that are doing something really unique on Twitch that's like not just gaming or something like that. Especially the recent talent that we uh, represent in this day and age are kind of like all people that don't do that. Um, more on that later. <laughs> okay, so um, that's boutique agencies. The last type of agency that I would say is a creative agency. Um, these are agencies that you typically never hear about, but they are by far the um, like the Madison Avenue like types. These are guys that, um, so the, the only example I really have for this is, uh, this is the second side of our business and, and sort of our main business. It's um, direct agency to brand relationships. Uh, so these, like in our case, it's like creative advertising uh, or designing advertisements or marketing campaigns for uh, larger brands in their particular space, which our case is like Twitch, YouTube, things like that. Don't need to concern yourself with these agencies too much because they don't typically take on talent, or if they do, they do it in a very limited way like we do. However, um, this is just something to note that these exist and that they, they are important because they make a, they, uh, they typically are, are, are very powerful, but few people kind of like know what they do. Okay, so those are the type of agencies. Um, are we doing good so far? I think we're doing pretty good so far. So the number one question that I get from streamers and YouTubers and content creators and viewers is when do I find an agency? When do I look? And this, I think, is the question um, I want to answer right now. So when do I look for an agency? When do I find an agency? Okay. I think that the best time to start looking for an agency is around 400 to 500 concurrent viewers. I think that the mistake that a lot of people make when they start streaming on Twitch, they start like making YouTube content or they start building a business or something is they think money, money, money. Like they, they want to monetize something like way too quick. Right. Whereas if you look at a lot of the really good streamers on Twitch, they don't really think about selling stuff. Right. They don't think about like, Oh, I need to be sponsored by a ton of people. Like there are some broadcasters that get sponsored more than others, but typically in the top, like 1% of broadcasters, they don't do this a lot. They don't like really think about it. The reason for that is because they're value driven. And this is something that I talk about all the time in whatever you do in life is you should be driven towards value, right? You should be out there trying to help people to try to provide something. So if you look at this broadcast, for example, that I run or this YouTube channel, we, as of this talk, we have no sponsors. I don't accept sponsors. Um, if people subscribe or they want to support the broadcast in some way, that's freaking great. But if they don't, that's also great because in my mind, what I'm doing here is I'm value driven. I want to add something to you where you walk away from this and you're like, damn, I like, I got something out of this that was really cool. And if you want to support it, you do so on your own volition because you think that it's worth doing. Um, I think a lot of people that email me um, and a lot of people that uh, talk to me about this 
they 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 get in the mindset that they should be earning money off of this, almost like some kind of like entitlement thing. Like I should be earning money off of this, and I should be getting sponsors, and like that's like part of like running a business. And what you want to be really careful of is that if you sort of inundate your content, is that a word? Inundate. If you infuse, if you if you encapsulate, if you if you if you if you swim and it's if you swim in the idea of like making money ads things like that you're actually going to dilute the reason why viewers came and saw you in the first place because they want to like be a part of like what is authentically um what is authentically you they, they want to be there for like the initial value they provide they don't want to see you like play some mobile game for like six hours in a stream and like you're going to lose like a lot of the a lot of times when um viewers come see you it's not their first impression of you and it's going to require several other impressions for them to become a follower so for someone to follow you as a content creator some people will do it on the first impression they'll be like dude this guy's like pretty sweet and like um i'll check him out again but a lot of people will do that on their second or third impression of of, of, hear, of hearing you this is why a lot of advertisers they focus on things like showing you ads like if you ever had you know how like you say something into like facebook and then Facebook shows you an ad for it. And then like you'll see another ad for it on Instagram. That's not a coincidence. Like what they're doing is they're trying to hit a certain uh, ceiling of advertisements to where you start thinking about that product. You make a brand association. And with broadcasters or content creators, same thing. Same exact thing. So during the time that you're starting to create content and grow, you want to be focusing on adding as much value as possible. Don't worry about it. The money will come later. I promise. The uh, you don't need to think about these things. I would even say that four to five hundred concurrent viewers is like very, very low end, and like maybe like a thousand to like fifteen hundred concurrent viewers. And then in YouTube terms, this would be like um, starting at like maybe fifty k subscribers, like low uh, to like I would say ideal like two fifty k to five hundred is like a good. Uh, area to start looking for agency representation. And by this time, you'll be getting a zillion uh, different offers and things like that, too. Keep it in mind, so this is the top, like, 0.001% of uh, people, like, that will do this. So um, this is probably an answer that a lot of people don't expect. They might think that they should be doing this way earlier, but the best advice I can give you is do not focus on making money at first. Focus on – the only question you should be asking yourself is – how do I create something that is compelling to people, that is different, and that inspires people or drives them to make uh, to, to, to be entertained or makes them laugh? Something like that, okay? Uh, that's what I would probably recommend. Uh, hopefully that helps. Okay, so that's when you look for an agency. Until then, I'd say until then. Also, these notes will be um, available on my Discord, exclamation mark Discord. Until then, don't worry about it. Focus on value and... Um, the quality of your thing. Okie day. What goes into... Actually, no. What's the answer to the question that everybody wants? How much money can you expect? <laughs> that is the real question that I know lots of people are here for. That's the one that we're probably going to end up on as uh, we go into the YouTube channel. The top three chips to... How to make the most amount of money as an agency number two will surprise you. That's where we're going to end up. How much money? All right, shut up, Devin Nash. Get to the point, dude. We don't care about how agencies work. How much freaking bucks can I bring home? How many bones? All right. Okay. So for a 1,500 to 2,000 concurrent viewer streamer, it's not unreasonable to have, I'd say, like four to six sponsors, each of which are paying you somewhere between the realm of $2,000 to $4,000 a month. Pretty reasonable. A little bit of variance here depends on how well you do CTAs. That's a call to action. It's like, so if I, I'm like, I would be paid more because I am a better salesperson. Like, I can do a sales pitch off the top of my head that's like pretty high value. Like, guys. You haven't drank water until you drink Essentia water. Let me tell you, okay? 9.5 pH, okay? This thing will melt all of your fears away it, with how high the pH is, okay? I'm not even sure pH works that way, but goddamn. I have never had water this good. I never drink tap water. Tap water is for actual subterranean people, people that live under the earth that are never heard from again. If you want to drink something that's top quality, I recommend Essentia water. And I will call that to action every 30 minutes if I'm getting paid to do it. 
Typically, people like that will actually get offered way more. This is like a really important thing for content creators to know. A lot of content creators don't think about this, but your value as a content creator is not just your viewership. It's not just your stats. It's also your ability to shout things out or to sell things. For example, Trainrex TV, one of my friends, gets a lot of premium deals because he is one of the best call to action dudes on Twitch. Oh my God, you will never hear him shut up about something like Cash App or, 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 or whatever he's sponsored by. He'll just go on and on and on about it. And so that goes into your value as well. So you can expect a higher amount of money if you're doing that. Um, brand deal. So there are a lot of different things and there's way too much. This video is already really long in the context of like what we're talking about. There is way, way too much to go over. But uh, suffice to say, there are certain situations where certain situations where larger broadcasters can expect uh, anywhere between $8,000 to $10,000 an hour in appearance fees, um, $20,000 day rates or higher. I've sold all this stuff. Um, I actually talked to a person that had a million dollar day rate. That was pretty crazy. That was like an actually Hollywood celebrity. It was like literally just like if you want this guy on site, it's a million dollars. That's it. Like that's they would not talk to you unless you did that. It was hard to imagine, but that was actually true. Um, they would uh, individual sponsors will pay anywhere between um, anywhere between like ten thousand to fifteen thousand dollars a month. This is the typical rate of top Twitch streamers right now. I haven't really seen deals that are higher than that, but I'm sure they exist. But I haven't seen them, so it must be new to me. Um, this is for top Twitch streamers. Top YouTubers are in a totally different universe. Uh, this is usually paid per video or paid uh, per month also or paid for uh, deliverables in uh, descriptions or other media. Uh, and uh, these deals for certain YouTubers can be in the millions of dollars easily. Uh, but they're already making a lot of money off of ad revenue, so. You... You can expect as a 1,500 concurrent viewer streamer, there's no real reason why you shouldn't be making full-time income. And probably most 1,500 viewer streamers that are set up for um, for broadcasting the right way will be making around 150 to $200,000 a year with few exceptions. Um, monetization and awareness of this matters a lot. I have met streamers that are like three to 4,000 viewers and they're earning like less than $500 a month just because they just aren't wise about their calls to action. So it does make a big difference. I've also met people that are making over 500 K a month. Oh, excuse me. That's an insane number. 500 K a year um, that are, that are in their like 1500 to like 2000 viewer range. Uh, they have an abnormal amount of subs, good calls to action. They have other ways to monetize like merch or Patreon or things like that. So there's a lot of variance in these subjects, generally things that you can expect. And obviously there's some top Twitch streamers. The variance is even better. Um, there are several, Twitch streamers right now that are earning between like three to five million viewers per or three to five million uh, per year pretty easily. Okay. Uh, let's say, so I think this is like probably the most important part. How do you find a good agency? And then I think I might have to end this here. I, I, I didn't really realize like how much we're covering in like one talk. Holy crap. This is actually a lot. How do you find a good agency? What makes one good? So this on its own could be its like own talk, but I think suffice to say, the first thing to do is understand the offer. Watch my other video on this, um, how agencies steal from Twitch and YouTubers and Twitch streamers, which also applies to music industry and business people as well. Um, understand the pitfalls, the high percentages, the, um, the over promises and things like that. Understanding the offer and reading the contract can be the first step to understanding if this is a good agency. Talking to people that are already in the agency is an obvious but very good first uh, first step. Um, also, um, establishing to what extent possible great KPIs, objectives, things like that. So let's say, can we say, um, how many deals will you bring me? Per month, can we put a number on that? They might say one, but if they're guaranteeing you one deal a month, that's already pretty good. They're already pretty confident. Uh, understanding the structure. So these are questions like, um, and you have an obligation to ask these questions as you're going in. Um, how many salespeople do you have dedicated to what? Uh, do I have an account manager? How much time can I expect from that person? Um, Let's see what else. Uh, what kind of partnerships 
do you have with existing brands? That's really powerful because they might be able to get you under those. Let's keep going. Um, asking all these questions are really good. You, and like what you do is like you approach like three or four of these agencies and then you compare the questions. And this may seem like a lot of work, but this is at a minimum a two-year commitment that you're going to be making. It's going to define your brand going forward and the kind of like money that you make and the partnerships. It's absolutely worth doing this. Think of it like buying a house or like making a significant business decision. The agency that you choose is going to be really important for your future. So you want to put the time into doing this. Uh, what are good questions to ask agency? Who would I ask myself? Um, oh, uh, do you have anyone in the agency that has been an influencer um, or for some reason understands this? This is actually a really underrated thing. I think that Nerd Fusion is one of the only agencies as of this time that's like for influencers run by influencers. I think that makes a big difference. Um, it's kind of jerking myself off a little bit, but like I, I do think that's one of our competitive advantages. And a lot of times you'll have... I believe UTA has some people as well that have been influencers in the past. This can help because it's people that kind of understand the the sort of like content brain, um, particularly like, but but this sort of, this leads into, do you have a past portfolio uh, keyword that you can demonstrate of success in sales and uh, influencing, uh, influencer type stuff? And one thing you kind of want to look at is like, Anyone that's like kind of telling you, okay, like how we can make you grow, you should be really, 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 I think, um, I don't know if like resistant is the right word, but just be like really wary when people say they're going to grow your brand and they kind of just like throw that in there. I don't think that those agencies are totally honest. First of all, it's not. It's not the job of an agency to grow your brand. It's the job of an agency to sell your brand. And that's a big difference, right, that we kind of clarified up here. Um, second of all, there's no reason to believe that an agency would be able to grow your brand if they haven't grown brands themselves. And very few agencies have significant brands. If you look at all the agencies that we listed here, none of these people have any brands, right? Like, they, like So expecting them to know like how to create content and how to grow your brand – this is a really, really big thing that I think is a really common like problem that people like. People think that they're going to join an agency to grow themselves, but um, growing yourself is like bas basically exclusively you. It's like you that's going to be able to do that. Your, uh, your, you creating content, you making things happen. Your agency or your partners are not going to be able to do that for you. They may give you partnerships that get you more exposure and things like that, but just be very careful with how people sell you on this. Um, you might be able to tell if an agency is like kind of over promising, if they tell you like, yeah, man, we're going to make you huge. Like you'll hear that a lot from esports teams and stuff like that. And it's almost never the case. Like people that were going to be huge or like people that are working hard on their own YouTubes and their own channels. And they're going to do that anyway. Right. So I'd be really careful about that kind of thing. Is there anything else that I would say, like, how do you find a good agency? Like already asking all of these questions, reading the contracts, understanding the offer, um, watching my previous video on this, which is like going over like what makes an unfair contract and understanding how to get rid of those uh, pitfalls, I think is like super duper important. And I think if you understand and you ask all these questions, you compare yourself across to multiple agencies, you'll be in a pretty good place. You've probably done way more work than 99.9% .9 of the people that are in that have ever looked for an agency. Or and and in and insofar as doing that, your your business mind is going to reward you. You're going to make a lot more money, and you're going to be uh, a lot less prone to like catastrophic risk. Is there anything else I'm left leaving out? I don't think so. I think that like we're pretty good. Um, I think this is a, a really comprehensive talk. Um, I guess it I guess it bears repeating, uh, which I've br brought up before. Um, never ever ever underestimate legal representation. I guess I'll just put that down again. Get any kind of lawyer who isn't associated with the agency get them to read the contract understand it whatever um that's it i think that's uh i think that's everything getting a lawyer doesn't insult the agency it doesn't make it, it doesn't make uh, anyone feel like the agency is bad or something um it just like it doesn't make you feel like the, the talent is bad or you don't really want it or whatever it's just a professional thing to do uh looking at entertainment law there are some great lawyers you can reach out to in the space, particularly for YouTubers and Twitch streamers, um, Bryce at Esports Law, 
Um, Ryan Fairchild is really good. Um, he, uh, I, I, I think, uh, if you looked at it for him, these are, I, I actually, I would, my number one recommendation would be Ryan Fairchild. I think he's really good right now. Uh, I'll find his Twitter real quick just because I think people will be looking. He is a really, I mean, dude, he even has fair in his last name. Like, how are you going to, so his Twitter is at fair play esports. He, uh, I like him a lot because he is part of a much bigger law firm that covers all kinds of entertainment law. So he can also access that. And again, um, just because he doesn't have like a very big brand, doesn't mean that he's not uh, a very, very fair person. And I just, I know for a fact that he doesn't have any bias or association with agencies. So I think that he's uh, very good. You want to be careful about some lawyers also have crossover representation with agencies as well. Want to be careful with that. What's the best way to find ethical agencies? I got a lot of cold emails from agencies reaching out. Is it worth setting up calls and seeing what they can offer you? Uh, if you're getting like a cold email that's like on blast and they haven't like paid attention to you specifically as a creator, then probably not. If it's like, hi, I'm Rosen. And then you like, you know, your name is like copy and paste in there. I just throw those out. I think those are not worth your time. But if someone has taken the time to craft like a custom email to you and it's something that is like unique and, and it's going to like help you, then yeah, yeah, you should, you should hear them out. Do a phone call. Hi, I work for an agency in APAC, and I agree with a lot of your sentiments. Something I need our agency to fix. That said, I want to ask you what an ideal ratio of creators to agents and managers. Ooh, what a good question. Um, I it, it, So the answer is complicated. It depends on what your agency is, the type of agencies you are. So for a boutique agency, it's going to be much more uh, hands-on and white glove than a deal flow agency. So if you're just bringing deals to people, that are all you need are campaign managers to manage those deals. So you'd look at like a ratio of like maybe like one to eight. So that's like one campaign manager for every like eight broadcasters, one to 10 maybe even. Um, for like a boutique agency, it would be much, much more specific, right? Because you're looking for like one to three or like maybe like one to four or even one to two, right? Depending on the size of your creators. And remember also, if your agency represents a lot of really, really big talent, then you're going to want to do one-to-ones, right? Because those people will probably, like people in Hollywood have like a full-time agent that just does their shit and a full-time uh, manager that just does their shit. That would be my answer to that question. Cool. Okay. Have we done it? Um, I think we've done it. I hope this has been helpful. I didn't realize how comprehensive this was going to be getting into it. Um, I hope that it helps. Oh my goodness. It's a little bit overwhelming to do this talk. Like I, I just, uh, I just like feel like I, I just really hope that I got it right because I, I, this is a really important subject and everyone is, I, I just, I hope you guys got something out of it. Now you might, even if you're never intending to be a content creator or deal with agencies ever, you're going to know how agencies and uh, talent actually interact. And that's going to be really powerful going forward and maybe will help you in your career somehow. So hopefully this was helpful. Uh, if it was that, and you got this far, then toss the stream of follow twitch.tv slash Devin Nash, toss the YouTube a like or a subscription that would uh, help me a great deal. Turn on notifications for these videos because I upload all over the place or join the Discord, discord.gg slash Devin. And uh, I just hope this has been helpful. I would really appreciate if you subscribed because you, got, you don't have to give me anything. I don't want anything, but subscription would be nice. Thank you very much. And we will see you again next time for the next talk. Good stuff.